How is everybody? How many of you were here last night? Wow. We made some memories last night. As it was pouring down rain, we gathered up here on the stage and the choir began to sing and we made a lot of friends. Heard some interesting stories. You know, I'm not a bit discouraged. I know these things happen. And you know, the Bible tells us, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, God sends the rain on the just and the unjust. You know, sometimes rain happens. And so, praise the Lord that he held back the rain for tonight, and we're able to get together and study God's word. And I'm so thankful that you came. Now, this is not the last meeting. We have a meeting tomorrow night and the next night, and we'd like to see even more people come. You know, folks around the country are celebrating a holy week this week as they commemorate the events in Jesus' life. And I can't think of any better way to remember Jesus than to come, come together as his children and listen to his word. What do you think? So I look forward to seeing you, and we hope that this, uh, these meetings will grow. Tonight is a very important subject, because if you understand the essence of what we're going to talk about tonight, and I'm going to tell you an amazing story in the message, you understand that, and it will really change your life. And this is not only an important message for Christians. This is an important message for anyone that wants to really know, how can I know God? How can I have a new life? How can I have a better life? Maybe you feel powerless and you'd like to know, how can I receive the kind of power to feel like I'm not so helpless that there's some direction in life? And so we'll be talking about that. The message tonight is open your windows. And it's taken from one of the most famous stories in the Bible about Daniel in the lion's den. Now I know it's dark out there and you probably couldn't read the Bibles if you had one. I'll be putting some pictures on the screen and I'll be reading the verses to you. But if you can remember Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6 is where you find this story. And it's an amazing story of God's deliverance. And there's lessons in here for us that will help us unlock some of the hidden Bible truths that a lot of people do not understand. So. I'm going to go to you, and first I'd like to begin by giving you a little background of what happens in this story. You've probably heard the expression before, handwriting on the wall. The handwriting on the wall. The Babylonian king, Belshazzar, was a wicked king. And he was having a wild party for all of his lords and all of, his ma all of the leaders in the Babylonian kingdom. The Babylonians had carried the Jews off captive about 60, 70 years earlier, and many of them had been held in captivity in Babylon for many years. And this king was wanting to show that the, Babylon, that the uh, Jewish God had no power, so he began to mock the God of Israel. And he went and he began to call for the holy vessels that had been in the temple of God, and they were drinking, and they were mocking the God of Israel, and they were praying to their idols of gold and silver and wood and stone. And while the king of Babylon was having this drunken party, and they were mocking Jehovah, suddenly a hand appeared, a bloodless hand. And it began to write in burning letters on the walls of Babylon, Mini, Mini, Tikal, you farsen. And those letters were there, just fiery letters, and everybody in the banquet hall was terrified. And they were wondering what that could mean. And the king was so frightened, the Bible says his knees were smiting together. That means when your knees knock together like that. I remember the first time I ever got up in front of a crowd to preach. My knees were smiting together. And I was glad that there was a podium there so nobody could see my knees shaking. Well, this king was scared half to death. And he called his wise men. And he said... I'll give a great reward to anybody that can tell me what this writing says. And he brought in his wise men, and none of them could translate for the king what the writing said. Finally, the queen mother remembered. She said, there is an old prophet that used to serve King Nebuchadnezzar, and nothing was a mystery for him. His name is Daniel. 
And so the king summoned Daniel. And Daniel came and he interpreted the writing. The writing said, Meeny, meeny, tickled you, farson. It meant, Your kingdom is weighed in the balance and found wanting, and it's delivered to the Medes and the Persians. In other words, you are facing judgment. Tonight, your kingdom is going to be destroyed. You've been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Your kingdom's been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. That's Daniel 5, 27, 28. And that very night, while king of Babylon was having that drunken party, he was ignoring the fact that the Medo-Persians had surrounded Babylon. They thought Babylon will never fall. We've got great big walls. We've got guard towers. But Cyrus the general, Cyrus the Persian general, had diverted the Euphrates River where it normally would run underneath the walls of Babylon, he redirected his soldiers, all worked together, and they dug a big ditch. And they redirected the water, so the water stopped running for a little while under the walls. And his army was able to sneak under the walls where the river went. The gates were left open because everyone in the city was drunk. And the Medo-Persians conquered the city of Babylon that night. That was all prophesied in the book of Isaiah that that would happen. Well, what the king of uh, Medo-Persia did, first thing he did when he came into power, is he killed all of those who were loyal to the Babylonian king, with one exception. He spared an old Jewish prophet who had been an advisor to Nebuchadnezzar by the name of Daniel. Because there was something unusual about Daniel, and Daniel had a connection with God. Now, I'm going to read this to you from the Bible. Again, this is found in Daniel chapter 6. And it's, it talks here about the, uh, the incredible faith that Daniel had. It pleased Darius. Darius is the Medo-Persian king. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes and for them to be over the whole realm. And over these, three governors of who Daniel was one, or the chief, that the princes might give account to them that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and the princes because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king was thinking about setting him over the whole realm. The king, when he set up the new government, when the Medo-Persians conquered the Babylonians, he had an incredibly large kingdom. Matter of fact, the Persian Empire was one of the largest empires in the world, historically. And he was looking for people he could trust. We all know that sometimes there's crooked politicians. But he saw Daniel was faithful. The Bible said Daniel could be trusted. But the problem was Daniel, he was a captor from Judah. And the other Medo-Persian princes and governors, they thought, why is the king thinking about putting Daniel in charge of us? He's a captor from the former empire. He's from another nation. But the king said, but he's faithful. I can trust him. Everything he does, he's truthful. I heard about a professor at Vanderbilt University. He was getting ready to give his students a test in trigonometry. And just before the big test, the professor told his class, I'm giving you two tests today. And they all got so scared. He said, one test is in trigonometry. One test is in honesty. Because sometimes college students cheated on their tests. And the professor said, if you're going to fail one of these tests, fail trigonometry. Because there's a lot of good people out there that don't understand trigonometry, but there are no good people that don't understand honesty. Daniel was someone that was honest, and the king knew that he could trust him. But that really threatened the other people in the kingdom. It says they wanted to get rid of Daniel because they couldn't take bribes with Daniel around. So the governors and the princes tried to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they couldn't find any charge or fault because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. Now I told you that uh, I'm going to share with you some secrets that some people don't know and very few pastors talk about. In the Old Testament, you will find many shadows and types of Jesus. A lot of the stories in the Old Testament are telling us about Jesus before he even came. One of these stories is right here. Was Jesus faithful in everything he did? Yes. 
Where, did Jesus have enemies that followed him around and spied on him to find something he did wrong? Yes. Could they find any fault in Jesus? No. Pontius Pilate, when Jesus was being tried, he said, I find no fault in him. And even though they looked and they searched and they spied on him, he was faithful. And the religious leaders were threatened because Jesus had a high position with the Father. He was the Son of God. So they were threatened at his high position, just like these other leaders were threatened that the king was going to set Daniel over the whole realm. So they're trying to find something wrong. But there wasn't any error or fault found in him. That means when they had spies follow him around, he was not only faithful in public, Daniel was faithful in private. Someone said character is what you are when you don't think anyone is watching. Are you a consistent, faithful believer in God? So these men got together, Daniel chapter 5. They said, we're not going to find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. We're going to have to trap him regarding the law of his God. So the governors and the princes thronged together before the king, King Darius, and they tried to tempt the king to write a law. Now uh, here, this is a king thinking to set Daniel over the whole realm. And the presidents and the princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. But they couldn't find any fault or anything wrong in him. So they decided to set a trap. And they said, if we can get the king to sign a law regarding worship. Now why is this important to us today? You know, the Bible says in the last days that there's going to be a law regarding worship. Whoever does not worship the image of the beast cannot buy or sell, and whoever does not worship the image of the beast ultimately will be killed. So when we look at the story of Daniel, we can learn some lessons about how to survive what's happening in the future. Now, they went before the king and they said, King, we all got together and we thought that it would be a good idea for you to sign a law that nobody should pray to any god or man except you, O king, for 30 days, just for one month. And the reason was, when you've got a new empire, and you've got people that speak different languages, and you've got people from all different backgrounds and different cultures and different races, it's hard to unite those different people unless you can unite them through common worship. You know, the Caesars of Rome, they claim to be gods. You think they really believed they were gods? Well, some of them may be crazy and they thought that, but most of them realized they needed the people to think they were gods so they could unite the empire through common worship. The pharaohs of Egypt said, we are gods. They knew they weren't gods. All you've got to do is stub your toe against the wall and you realize you're not divine. I mean, they all knew that, but they made the people think they were gods because they thought if... If they think we're gods, it'll unite the kingdom through fear and common worship. Well, King Darius, his advisor said, you know, this is very important right now. Just for 30 days, only 30 days, we'll declare that no one is to pray but anyone but you. They can't pray to anyone but you just for 30 days, and it'll bring the new kingdom together. So, King Darius, he thought about it for a while, and he thought, well, you know, these are my wise men, and this is what they're recommending. And so he thought it must be a good law. And I suppose it flattered the king a little bit. But he didn't know what they were up to. You see, these men knew that Daniel was very religious. And that he prayed regularly. And if they could make a law that said you can't pray to any god or man except the king for 30 days. Someone would catch Daniel praying. Because Daniel had a custom of every day he would climb to his upper room. He would open his windows. He would kneel down so everyone could see that he was praying. And he would pray towards Jerusalem. And the king had forgotten that Daniel, his faithful servant, had this very regular devotional life. And so the king thought, well, if you think it's a good idea, and the king signed the law, and he signed the writing. Well, this is where the story gets very interesting. It says, he signed the writing according to the law of the Medes and the Persians that does not alter. Matter of fact, three times in Daniel chapter 6, Daniel 6 verse 8, Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing 
that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the writing and the decree. You know, the next verse in this story is one of the great verses in the Bible. It's Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. Daniel chapter 6, verse 10. If you can get that verse in your life, it'll really change you. It tells us now when Daniel knew that the writing, the law was signed, he went to his upper room with his windows being open towards Jerusalem. Talk to you about the sermon title is Open Your Windows. And he knelt down on his knees three times that day and he prayed and he gave thanks to God as was his custom since early days. Daniel knew that he was going to be killed if he was caught publicly praying, and he still did it. Is your relationship with God so close, so important, that you would rather die than willingly dishonor God? You know, this isn't the only story like this in the Bible. If you read in Daniel chapter 3, it talks about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. It tells about King Nebuchadnezzar making a golden image. And he said that everybody needed to bow down and pray to his idol, his image. You know, the Bible says in the Ten Commandments, you are not supposed to pray to idols. You all know that. That's the second commandment. If that bothers you, please don't be mad at Pastor Doug. I didn't write it. You need to take that up with the Lord. He wrote it, right? We all know lots of dear people that don't know about that commandment. But the Bible says you will not make an image of anything in the heaven above or the earth beneath or the water under the earth. You shall not bow down yourself to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. If you love God, what do you do? You keep his commandments. One commandment says don't make idols and bow down to them. Another commandment says, thou shalt not have other gods before me. That's the first commandment. In order for Daniel to shut his windows and not pray, he would be worshiping King Darius as God. He thought, I would rather die than break God's commandments. The only ones who will survive the mark of the beast in the last days are people who love God so much, they would rather die than deliberately break his commandments. Now, that doesn't mean that people are perfect, as you might think, but they don't knowingly, deliberately disobey God's law. You and I should love the Lord so much we would rather die than dishonor him. You know, there's a lot of people through history where evil enemies and dictators have told them, renounce your faith in God or you will be killed. Renounce your faith in God or you're going to go to prison. Karen and I did some meetings in the Soviet Union back in 1992. Finally, communism fell. For the first time, we went to this town. There had been no meeting like this in this town for 70 years because Christianity was illegal. People didn't have Bibles. The ones who had Bibles hand wrote them or typed them underneath the table so that the communist guards would not hear them. And some of them had to have so much faith in God, if the guards caught them with a Bible, they would say, you need to spit on the Bible and if they didn't spit on the Bible, they would either be killed or they'd go to Siberia. I know Pastor Lowell, you and Sandra and your family, you were in Hungary, you saw those things. There are people that have that kind of faith where they would rather die, they'd rather go to prison than deliberately dishonor God. Daniel had that kind of conviction. He had been serving God all of his life. He was an old man now, probably 85 years old, and he thought, I'm not going to stop serving God now. Some of us, we might have thought, well, I'm going to keep praying to God, but I'm not opening my windows because you're looking for trouble. I mean, you know, didn't Jesus say, when you pray, enter into your closet and shut the door, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. I'm going to go pray in my closet right now. And everybody was probably gathered in the courtyard to see what Daniel was going to do. But what did Daniel do? When Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house his windows being open, his chamber towards Jerusalem. He knelt upon his knees three times that day. He prayed and he gave thanks as he had always done. 
Everybody knew that Daniel, three o'clock, or rather three times a day, just like clockwork, they'd see his windows open, they'd see his shining face right in the window, he prayed towards Jerusalem. Why did Daniel do that? Because Daniel read the Bible and Daniel prayed. Do you know it says in the Bible that if the children of Israel were carried away captive because of their unfaithfulness, Solomon said when he had his dedication prayer, Solomon said, if your people are carried away captive, if they pray towards this place here in heaven and answer their prayer, Daniel read that in the Bible. He said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to read it, and I'm going to do it. Even if no one else does it, I'm going to do it because I'm going to follow God's word. By the way, friends, if you think you're going to get to heaven by doing what's popular or by doing what everyone else is doing, you're going to be in trouble. You'll be disappointed. Jesus said, straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few there be that find it. Broad is the way and wide is the gate that leads to destruction, and many go down that road. Jesus said, many, many will come to me in that day, saying, Lord, Lord, we taught in your streets, we cast out devils, we did many wonderful works, and they'll say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I don't know you. There's going to be crowds of people who are very religious, but they're doing what the crowd does. If you're going to make it to the kingdom, you need to do what God's word says. And God's word said, pray towards Jerusalem. So Daniel was praying towards Jerusalem. Why did Daniel pray three times a day? Because Daniel read where it said in Psalm 55, 17, morning, evening, and at noon will I pray and lift up my voice. Three times a day, David talked about praying. Daniel read, or King David said, three times a day, Daniel said, God is first for me. And you might think, well, you know, Pastor Doug, I can't pray three times a day. I'm too busy. Oh, really? You're busier than the prime minister of Babylon? Daniel was the prime minister. That's a busy job for the biggest empire in the world. And he told the king, Nebuchadnezzar, he told King Evil Merodach, he told King Belshazzar, I don't how, care how much business you've got for me, it's going to have to fit around my prayer life. Because what profit is it if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? Daniel had the priority of seeking first God's kingdom and his righteousness. And you, good time for prayer is not found or discovered by accident. A good time for prayer is made. You need to make an appointment with God. How important is God to you? Is it part of your schedule? Do you try to say, well, you know, I'd pray today and I'd read my Bible today, but Lord, you know, I'm busy. I got to get my breakfast and head off to work. What's more important? Your breakfast or your Bible? You know, the Bible tells us, Jesus said, man doesn't live by bread alone. Man doesn't live by breakfast alone but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. In the bachelor home, first thing we do, even in our hotel room, we're all staying in one room. We all get up, we have our worship, private worship. Then we get together, we pray together as a family. If you're in a family, everybody needs their own private time with God. And I wake up and I study my Bible on the computer. Mrs. Bachelor wakes up, she sits on the bed, she's got her books that she's reading. Nathan's got his books that he's reading. We all need our own relationship with God. And we pray every evening together. Sometimes during the day, I'm busy, I'm out working, and so I can't pray with a family. But I think we ought to pray all the time, too. The Bible says, pray without ceasing. That means that as you go through your day, you're always aware that God is there. God is with you. He's here now. Do you believe that? Jesus said, I'm with you wherever you go. Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'm there. So if Jesus is present when two or three gather in his name, are we gathered in his name right now? Are there more than two or three? So is God here? So can you talk to him in your heart even while I'm preaching? If you're going to do that, pray for the preacher. Among the things you talk about. Sometimes while I'm preaching, I send up a prayer and I say, Lord, help me. I don't know what I'm talking about. Sometimes I have to say, Lord, I forgot that verse. Give it to me. And he'll give me that verse again. Living in an attitude of prayer, not just when you're preaching, but all the time. Daniel had that kind of relationship. And if we're going to make it through the last days, we need to have that kind of relationship with God. We're always plugged into the Lord. When Daniel knew that the writing was signed, did Daniel know what that writing said? What, what did it say? If anyone is caught praying to any man or God for 30 days except the king, he is going to the lion's den. You will become cat food. What would you do if you knew if you're caught praying, you're going to become kitty food? 
Wouldn't that be a scary thought? Have you ever thought about different ways you might die? And some of you thought, oh, you know, if I die, I want to die in my sleep. Other people have thought, you know, I don't want to die suddenly in my sleep. I want the doctor to give me a few weeks warning. Other people thought, boy, the last thing I'd like, I'd hate to freeze to death. That'd be awful. Someone will say, oh, Lord, however you choose to take me, I don't want to burn. We all have these little fantasies. You figure you're going to die someday. You wonder, how's it going to happen? You know what I think a better question is to ask? Lord, however it does happen, let me be faithful. If I'm fed to the sharks or fed to the lions, let me be faithful. People worry about the time of trouble. You don't need to worry about the tribulation. You don't need to worry about torture. Just say, Lord, let me be faithful. Let me glorify you. You love the Lord so much, you say, you know, no matter what happens to me, have you ever watched someone you love suffer? I remember when um, one of our boys was just um, about 18 months old. He came down with spinal meningitis. Took him to the hospital. The doctors had to give him a spinal tap. He was just a little boy, big blue eyes, curly blonde hair. And the doctor who was doing this was just still learning. He was a young doctor, he, had, he was an intern. And when you do a spinal tap, they have to push a long needle between the vertebrae of your spine. That's where all your nerves are. And the doctor kept missing. And they couldn't give Micah any anesthetic. And so I'm in there with the doctors and my little baby boy is looking up to me and he's crying, Daddy, 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 why are you letting them hurt me like this? And the doctor three or four times was pushing this needle into his back and he's screaming, and it broke my heart to watch my boy suffer. I wanted to trade places with him. The suffering would not have been so bad as watching someone you love be hurt. Wouldn't you like to love the Lord so much that you'd rather suffer than hurt him? Does God love you so much that he let his son suffer for your sins? When Jesus hung on the cross and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, that broke the heart of our Heavenly Father. And he allowed his son to suffer like that because he loves you that much. That's a lot of love to watch your child suffer for someone that doesn't even love you. God loves us even when we don't love him. The Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ Jesus died for us. Daniel had that kind of love for the Father in heaven. It said, when Daniel knew the writing was signed, you know, the writing said he was going to the lions. But there is a verse in Psalms where King David said, you will deliver me from the lions. I think Daniel thought, Lord, if you want to, you can save me from the lions. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they said, King, we're not afraid. If our God wants to, he can save us through the fire. Because God says, when you go through the water, I'll be with you. When you go through the fire, I'll be with you. And they read that verse and they believed if God wanted to, he could save them. But you know, we need enough faith where even if God chooses not to answer our prayer, we are still going to serve him. Some of us get sick and we say, Lord, if you'll heal me, I'll serve you. You know when you really have faith is when you say, Lord, whether you heal me or not, I'll serve you. Are your prayers conditional? Sometimes God answers those prayers because he's merciful. But do you love the Lord so much where you say, Lord, even if you don't make me rich and famous, <laughs> even if you don't heal all my sickness, even if you don't do everything I'm asking, I'm going to serve you anyway. Even without signs and wonders and miracles, Lord, I'm going to serve you because you love me so much, you sent your son to save me. That's the kind of love we need for God. Can you say amen? He knelt upon his knees and he prayed three times that day. His windows being open. He might have thought, you know, I'm going to pray, but I'm going to shut my windows. Daniel said, no, I'm going to let my light shine. I'm going to let everybody see that I am not ashamed of my God. I'm going to open my windows and let everyone know what I believe. You know, there's a lot of Christians out there that are what you call secret Christians. But there's really no such thing as a secret Christian. Because if you're a secret Christian for very long, your secrecy will destroy your Christianity. If you're a real Christian, your Christianity will destroy your secrecy. Because you will not be able to keep it a secret. Jesus said, why do you light a lamp and put it under a bush? 
Put it on a hill where everybody could see it. Are you bold for Jesus? Do you let people know that you believe in God? He wants us to be his witnesses. Amen? If God's done wonderful things for you, don't hide it. Don't, be, don't let the devil intimidate you. Let people know what you believe. When our family goes to a restaurant, there might be a lot of people around. We pray and we thank God for our food. People do all kinds of crazy, embarrassing, foolish things in public. We could at least pray to Jesus in public, right? Don't be ashamed of your God. And you know, there's a lot of people who are watching when you don't think they're watching. Daniel said, I'm going to open my windows whether people are watching or not because God is watching. You never know when someone might be watching. You know, Pastor Doug is on television a lot. And um, not only around the world in North America, but a lot in our town in Sacramento. A matter of fact, we're on a whole lot in Sacramento because we have our own channel there. And sometimes I go to the store and I'm going up and down the aisles in the store and I'm looking for something and I'm mad because I can't find it. And I'm, I'm in a hurry and I'm looking at my watch and I'm going up and down the aisles and I'm saying, where is this? Oh boy, you know, I'm late and the line is long and, and I look real sour. And then someone will come around the aisle, they'll look at me and they'll say, are you that pastor on television? All of a sudden I smile and go, yes, I'm that pastor. And it's made me conscious that i got to be nice all the time because I want to be a positive witness for Jesus. But you know, even when nobody's watching you, God and angels are watching you, right? Jesus said, if we are faithful to confess him before men, he will confess our name before the angels in heaven. This is what God did for Job. God said to the devil, have you considered my servant Job that there's none like him in the earth? He's a faithful and just man that fears God and hates sin. God was bragging about Job because Job was a consistent witness Daniel opened his windows. He wanted everyone to know about his faith. Knelt on his knees, claimed the promises of God. But there was a problem. Daniel had a prayer life, bread as prayer for the soul. I got, got so excited preaching, I forgot about the slides. The king, the enemies of Daniel came to the king and they said, King, you remember that law you signed a few days ago? The king said, Yep. They said, that law, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which doesn't change. King said, yeah. He said, you know, there's someone in your kingdom that's not following your law. And the king said, how dare him? They said, it's that Daniel from the captives of Judah. Oh, when the king heard that, he thought, what have I done? They tricked me into writing a law. And the king knew he couldn't change his law. He didn't want Daniel to die. He realized they tried to trap Daniel to get rid of him because he was honest. And the king called the royal lawyers together. And he said, is there anything we can do? Is there any loophole? Is there any way that I can get out of putting Daniel in the lion's den? They've got all these witnesses that saw him praying publicly to his God, praying out loud. What can we do? And the lawyer said, you know, that law can't be changed. You signed it. And the king's word is law. And the king realized, you know what? If I change my own law, I can't be king anymore. A good king must be a just king and keep his law. And the king sought desperately until the going down of the sun to find some way to let Daniel get off the hook. And there was no way. You know, the Bible tells us these men assembled and they found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. And then they assembled and they said, King, you've got to throw him in the lion's den. Time's running out. Before the sun goes down, what time of day did Jesus die on the cross? Wasn't it around sundown? And the king was so sorry, he had to follow through with his law. You know, I was thinking about this, friends. I can think of maybe three times in the Bible when earthly kings have made laws they wanted to change, but they could not. For example, King Herod. He told his stepdaughter, if she would come out and dance, that he'd give her anything she asked for up to half his kingdom. King's word is law. Well, she danced and she said, I want the head of John the Baptist. Well, the king didn't want to do that because he knew John was a prophet, but he had made a promise and the king's word was law. And John the Baptist had to die. King Ahasuerus made a law that all the Jews would be attacked on a certain day. And then he found out Esther, his wife, was a Jew. What's he going to do? He couldn't change his law. 
The only thing he could do was make another law that gave the Jews the right to attack their enemies first. And then there are people in the world that claim to be Christians that say the God of heaven who spoke the law with his own voice and wrote it with his own finger is going to change the Ten Commandments. He wrote it in stone to represent how unchanging it is. You think God is going to change his law? These earthly, wishy-washy, evil kings would not change their law. Why would we think the holy king of the universe would change his law? Not on your life. God's law is forever. It's established forever. And you know, I even meet some Christians. It's hard to believe. I even every now and then encounter Christian pastors who say, we don't need to keep God's Ten Commandment law anymore. There are ceremonial laws that have passed away, but not the Ten Commandment law. It is still wrong to lie. It's still wrong to steal or to commit adultery. God's Ten Commandment law is forever. Amen? Well, the king couldn't change his law, so they came and they said, you've got to put him in the lion's den. And very reluctantly, the king had to follow through. It says, they answered and said, this Daniel is breaking your law. And the king wanted to uh, deliver him, but he couldn't. And it says, the king gave the command, verse 16 of Daniel 6, and they brought Daniel, and they cast him into the den of lions. But the king, as they were putting him in, the king spoke to Daniel. He said, your God, who you serve from time to time, he will deliver you. Now, I know you don't have Bibles in front of you, but I deliberately misquoted that, because I want you to notice a word. The king said, your God, who you serve occasionally, no, your God who you serve when it's convenient. Uh, he didn't say that. Your God who you serve when everyone around you is serving him. No. He said, your God who you serve continually, he will deliver you. You know, it's still true today. If you serve God consistently, he will deliver you. And the king said that, and they put Daniel in the lion's den. Now Daniel's an old man. Maybe they lowered him down. And they could hear all the lions growling and roaring down there. Daniel went in, and then they had to put a stone over the mouth of the lion's den. And the Bible says that the king went to his palace, and he passed the night in fasting, nor were there any instruments of music brought before him. You know, when Jesus was on the cross, the angels were not playing their harps in heaven, were they? Was Jesus placed in a tomb? Was there a stone placed over the mouth? The king sealed King Darius. He sealed the stone so the purpose might not be changed. Did Pontius Pilate have a seal placed on the tomb of Christ? And there was no singing in heaven when our king saw his son was in the lion's den. You know who that lion is? The Bible tells us, Peter says, the devil is going around as a roaring lion seeking whom he might devour. And the devil could not keep Jesus in the tomb. And the lions could not hurt Daniel. Because God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth. You know, I think Daniel had perfect peace. And when he first got in the lion's den, he probably read that verse in Psalms that said, You'll deliver me from the lion. He knew that God delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fire. And so... Daniel got lowered down, and he wasn't one bit afraid. You know, when you're with God, you're not afraid of the storm, are you? Peter, you can read in the Bible, when he was going to be executed the next day, Acts chapter 12, Peter's going to be beheaded by Herod the king the next day. He goes to sleep like a baby in the prison. He's not afraid. When you've got Jesus with you, you're not afraid of anything. If you've got God, and you fear God, you won't fear anything else. If you do not fear God, you will fear everything else. Got that? Everybody's going to be afraid. You just get to pick what you want to be afraid of. If you're a God-fearing person, you're not afraid of anything. If you live for God and you obey him and you fear God, you're not afraid of anything. That doesn't mean you're going to reach out and grab rattlesnakes. It just means that you've got a peace in your heart. Daniel was let down in that den, and he saw the lions weren't bothering him, and he stood there for a while. He probably was praying while he was in the lion's den. And the king gave the command. They brought him, and they cast him in the den of lions. He said, your God who you serve continually, he will deliver you. You know, friends, you can claim that promise for the last days. There's a time of trouble coming. 
And God's promise is, if you serve God continually, he will deliver you. You don't have to be afraid. You know why? Catch this. Christians do not die. They might go to sleep for a little while, but Christians don't die. You don't ever have to be afraid. Once you accept Jesus and you're born again, you have eternal life and it begins now. Jesus said the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That means it's within reach right now. You can have everlasting life. You don't have to be afraid of anything. You don't have to be afraid of death. If you have Jesus, don't have to be afraid of anything. If you're trusting in him and following him, if you don't have Jesus, you ought to be terrified of a thousand things because you have no peace or confidence from minute to minute. But if you put your life in God's hands, you don't have to be afraid. There Daniel was in the lion's den praying unafraid. You know, he was an old man and he had to spend the whole night. He probably got tired. And as one pastor said, he probably eventually leaned up against one of those sleeping lions and the lion was purring just like a vibrating bed. And eventually purred Daniel right to sleep. Until early in the morning, he saw some light flooding into the den because the king pulled aside the stone and the light came in and the king was afraid. And he says, Daniel, has your God who you serve deliver, uh, continually delivered you from the mouth of the lion? And when he put Daniel in the den, he said, your God will save you. But after a night, no one else had ever come out of that den alive. And the king wasn't so sure. And he said, has your God who you serve been able to deliver you? And Daniel said, O king, live forever. He had a good night's sleep. He had lion carpet mattress all night long. And he woke up refreshed and he said, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth. They've not hurt me in as much as I was innocent before you. Now, some people read this story about Daniel and the lion's den and they say, well, the reason that the lions didn't eat Daniel is because the Medo-Persian king had just killed a number of other Babylonian prisoners and fed them to the lions. And the lions had eaten so many other prisoners, they were full. And they were laying at the bottom of that den just burping and rolling over. And when they threw Daniel in, he was such a skinny old man, they said, oh, forget about it, I'm not going to eat him. But some people don't think it was a miracle. It reminds me of a story. There was a young man in New York City that had been on drugs and had a drinking and just was a lost sinner. He went to a Christian mission. He didn't know anything about the Bible, but he heard the evangelist preaching in the Christian mission and he accepted Jesus and he was so excited and he felt peace in his heart and he felt the Spirit of God. And they gave him a Bible. They said, you need to read your Bible. He said, I'm going to read the whole thing. I am so happy. No, God will save me. And he went and he sat down in Central Park and he started reading his Bible. And the young man was so excited. He said, praise the Lord. This is wonderful. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And he was so excited to read the truths of the Bible. He never really understood. An atheist man was walking by and he heard the young man saying, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And the atheist stopped and he said, why are you making all these religious expressions and all this noise? The young man said, oh, Mr. Now, the, the atheist was dressed really nice. You know, he was a successful Wall Street businessman. And he said, oh, mister, I'm reading the Bible. I just accept Jesus, and, and it's wonderful. I'm reading how the Lord performed a miracle, and he parted the Red Sea for the children of Israel to cross over, and he saved them by this great miracle. And the man said, oh, you're just not very educated. I understand. He said, that really was not the Red Sea. It was called the Sea of Reeds. And it was only about six inches deep. And a wind came by and parted the water a little bit. And they just went across in the mud. It was no real big miracle. He said, oh, I didn't know that. Thank you very much. And the atheist walked away. And he felt really good about himself. But he didn't get very far away. And as he was walking away, he heard the young man say, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And he turned right around. He came back. He said, now why are you hollering? He said, it's amazing. He said, the Lord just drowned the whole Egyptian army in six inches of water. You know, sometimes people think that these miracles in the Bible aren't miracles. It's like when they say, oh, Jesus, he didn't really feed those people with five loaves and two fish. Well, not only did he feed them, but there were 12 baskets of leftovers when he got done to prove it. Oh, Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. He just fainted on the cross. Oh, really? Then how did he escape from the Roman guards that 
were guarding the tomb. God always has follow-up for these miracles. Well, if you don't think the lions were hungry, you know, the Bible says that the king, after Daniel survived the lions then, it says the king was so glad, he commanded they should take Daniel up out of the den. He was taken up out of the den. No injury was found upon him because he believed in his God. He'll deliver you if you believe in your God. And the king gave a command. And they brought those men who had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them and their children and their wives. And the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever hit the bottom of the den. So you think the lions were hungry? That was a miracle. You know, I read something. Just in case you think this is not the power of God, I was reading the news in June 21st, 2005, in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, a 12-year-old girl was abducted and beaten by seven men who were trying to force her into a marriage. That's not uncommon in that part of the country. Suddenly, she was delivered by a pack of lions that charged the men, but they did not hurt the girl. The men ran off. Eventually, someone in her town heard about it, and they very carefully went and they found that this whole pride of lions had surrounded this girl and she was there resting on the ground between them. They had not laid a claw or a tooth upon her. And then there were several witnesses that said they came. When the men came to check, when the, her family came to check, they saw this with their own eyes and it was reported by AP News. The lions quietly got up and walked away and left the girl unharmed. God can still save people from the lions. And the same way that God delivered Daniel from the lion's den, who is the lion? The devil goes around. Can he save you and I from the temptations of the devil? Can he save us from death? You know, that pit that Daniel went in was kind of like the tomb that Jesus went in. Now notice, friends, were there spies following Daniel around? Did he have enemies that were falsely accusing him? Did the king declare like Jesus, I find no fault in him? Was Daniel put in a lion's den? Yes. Was Jesus put in a tomb? Was there a stone put on the mouth? Yes. Was there a seal? Yes. Did Daniel come out alive? Did Jesus come out alive? Daniel was innocent. Jesus was innocent. And the Bible says very early in the morning, the king came to the lion's den. Very early in the morning, the women came to the tomb. This is a true story. And I believe if God could do that for Daniel back then, he can still do it for us today. Do you love the Lord so much that you would rather die than disobey him? Do you want to love the Lord that much, friends, and have that kind of relationship? I want to have that kind of relationship. The Bible tells us that those that worship the beast in his image, they will put the worship of the world and the beast first. But those who have the seal of God will put the worship of God and his word first. We're going to need the kind of faith and relationship and love for the Lord that Daniel had. And you can have it. Yes, you can. Would you like to have that kind of faith? Would you like to know him better, friends? Then would you bow your heads with me as we pray? Father, we know that you're in this place. We thank you for preserving the weather tonight where we could hear your word. We would pray for your blessing to be on this group, Lord, to pour out your spirit on each person. Lord, we've talked about some simple truths that we need to read your word every day. We need to pray every day that we need to be willing to let our light shine and open our windows and let people know what we believe and that you will bless us with power. Little prayer, little power. Much prayer, much power. Lord, we want to have that power to live the Christian life. And Lord, we know you love us so much that you sent your son into the world to suffer and to die for our sins. Help us believe and know that if you loved us that much, to let your sin, son suffer as he did, that it's possible for each of us to be saved. Give us that faith that you can finish the work that you started in our lives. Help us to have the faith of Daniel. I pray you'll bless each of these people, Lord. Bless them in their hearts. Bless them in their lives. Bless them, Lord, in their families. Bless them in their health. Bless them in their work. Bless them in their witness. And Lord, we pray that you'll pour out your spirit on these meetings. Continue to bring these friends 
And like Daniel, help us be witnesses and bring others to come. Be with us now through the remainder of this night. And as we praise you with music, we ask in Christ's name. Amen.